I'm going to start off. My name is Sean. I go by Dave M. And I'm a student coordinator. And I'm like really happy to be here. <laughs> but I am, I am really juiced to be here. I know it doesn't, I have RBF really bad. <laughs> but I am really happy to be here. And I want, like, I'm going to pass it on to Aaron. Thank you. So my name is Era. I use she, her pronouns. I consider myself a queer, um, Vietnamese, Chinese, uh, cis woman. And then I'm also on the student coordinators. Oh, uh, on identity, I am a non-binary, non-gender conforming cis male. It's very complicated. Like, I had to figure it out. It's like my choice. Anyway, and I'm from the city, so it's like, this is really cool to have this here. Fuck SFPD. Thanks, Sean. And then Sean will continue forward with your bad acknowledgement. So, right, we acknowledge that San Francisco is located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Alani peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. Right, there's no such thing as a native. You were born and raised here. Don't call yourself an SF native. You're not a native. Um, we encourage non-Indigenous members to uplift the work of rematriation and land taxes. Next slide. We want to be intentional. Thank you. We want to be intentional with how we are creating Black, Indigenous, and POC-centered spaces. We want to move forward by creating practices to prioritize BIPOC members and proactively decenter whiteness and dismantle white supremacy, anti-blackness, misogynoir, and colorism. And because of that, we're going to open the discussion only to BIPOC people for tonight, censoring queer people and disabled BIPOC with the last 10 minutes being open to all if there is time. In future sessions, the discussion portion will be open only to BIPOC and communities who are primarily impacted by the session topic. The chat is open to all. However, we ask my folks to please be mindful of taking up too much space. The Zoom sessions will continue to be open for all to join. Um, also, a feedback form with an anonymous option will also be shared in an email to all membership. And I'm gonna sit there and say this, right? It, it sounds harsh, but if you're really with the program, you should get it. Right, for real, for real, like, like, for real, for real. If you're really with like dismantling white supremacy, you should really understand that this space was created to be a healing space for people of color and people of color that have been impacted. So it's never any shade because we realize we have allies and allies are very, very important. And we realize that allies also do the work, but at the same time, allies need to understand to step up and step back or move up and move down. Right, then like so it's like I said, it's no shade, but like if, if like you don't get it, you just don't get it. And this like harshly enough may not be the class for you. Straight up. Thank you, Sean. Right on. And then and something else that we're incorporating in this class is aside from how we're intentionally dismantling white supremacy and then building towards abolition for all and centering blackness is the care aspect. So this is something that we're still figuring out along the way, especially because we're in a virtual space. Um, I have someone named Kari that is facilitating this portion. Although for this session, we ask that if you are triggered by any of the materials here, please feel free to take a step, uh, take a break from the, the Zoom session and then let us know if you need any resources. You could always DM me about that. And with that, we are actually gonna continue forward with the critical resistance session. And they'll be discussing an overview of the prison industrial complex. Yeah, thank you folks. Thank you all. Okay, great. Um, well, my name is Sheba. I'm a member of Critical Resistance and I'm joined by Nick. Uh, Nick, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. my name is Nick. I use he him pronouns and a member of the Critical Resistance chapter of, of the Oakland chapter of Critical Resistance. Awesome. Okay, my name is Sheba. Pronouns are she or they. Um, so we're going to get started today um, talking about definitions, um, definition of prison industrial complex or PIC, definition of abolition, um, and because we know it's your topic for today, we're going to talk about the connection between PIC and slavery. 
Um, then we're also going to talk a little bit about how we can organize for abolition. So it can seem really complicated sometimes, like what is a reform versus what is abolition? How do we know if we've, we've reached abolition or in our, in our demands? Um, by looking at two of what we call the seven easy steps to abolition. And then Nick is going to close us off by talking about a current campaign that we're in um, to close DA prisons. So good way for you to get involved now in the fight. All right, so we're going to start with what is CR? <laughs> Critical Resistance is a member-led organization, and we work um, on like a three-part platform, basically, to dismantle, to change, and to build. And we believe you have to do all three of these things, basically, at the same time. We have to dismantle um, the prison industrial complex um, and how it, how it works in forced on our lives and keeps people caged. We also have to change the, the policies that give it power and the beliefs that give it power, including racism and xenophobia and um, heterosexism. We um, also need to build the things that will help keep our communities thriving and safe. And we need to um, be doing this at the same time. We don't believe that you can only dismantle, but we also um, will need certain transformative things to, um, to respond to harm. We need uh, to have our basic needs met. We need to be able to thrive even beyond our basic needs. So um, going to play a little video from this amazing abolitionist activist, Miriam Kaba, um, about why analysis is important, because we're going to get into some kind of complicated definitions. Um, and this really helps me to kind of ground in why, why we do that, <laughs> why we get, why we need to understand the definitions of prison industrial complex and abolition. It's essential for people to, um, to learn together in order to be able to understand what we're up against. I think that precision in uh, our analysis is going to actually allow us to be much more successful than to be imprecise in what we're actually trying to dismantle. And more importantly, to not know what we're trying to build. And I don't think you can work on your own. There's definitely no way to dismantle the systems that we're trying to dismantle on our own, that's first and foremost. And I think it's we learn together um, how to fight. And part of that is to learn together, literally, in settings where we can argue things out, where we can debate, where we can um, struggle over big ideas together. Um, and I, I, I found over the years um, that sometimes that's seen by people as a form of elitism and a form of being removed from kind of the real work that needs to happen. For me, that is the real work that needs to happen because in building those relationships, in sharing our ideas, we're stronger. Um, and what we have right now is a very weak set of actors on the left um, that aren't going to be able to withstand the forces of the state that are already marshaled on a regular basis to crush us. So, um, so I think we got to know what we're facing, and that's a big part of what I try to do, um, both in calling people in to uh, think about big ideas, but also to think about history, not because I think that history repeats itself. I don't believe that, and I also don't believe that um, just knowing your history is enough. I don't want history to be a constraint on action. I want it to be a guide that um, helps us to kind of find our bearings um, and, and develop a common language for how we're going to fight. Great. So I just want to share that to, um, to help think about a, a, re, a, a way to be framing this, that learning, we're still in this journey of understanding um, the entire complexity of imprisonment and policing and surveillance in this country, but we need to understand that in, in order to be able to dismantle it. Um, and also in order to be able to know what to build. So let's go a bit into what the prison industrial complex is. So we also call it the PIC. Um, this is um, an overlapping interest of government and industry. So think corporations that use surveillance, policing and imprisonment 
as solutions to economic, social, and political problems. Um, so what does that include? It, it means not just prisons, but it also means um, the laws that the government makes in order to decide who has committed a crime. It means the sentencing and guidelines um, that determine how long someone is imprisoned. Um, it means um, something what, which I have learned uh, in the last few years, policies around conservatorship, which means that people who have behavioral health needs um, can be determined to be imprisoned uh, in hospitals, in their homes, um, based on the, the decisions made about their mental capacity. Um, so we're constantly learning that there are these different, these different interests that are um, creating this system of caging people um, in America and also beyond. Um, I also think about uh, certain policies that corporations will push and lobby for that will result in uh, greater imprisonment based on um, the taking of property. Uh, one that was actually a proposal very recently in California and was sponsored by Costco. Um, so we're always learning that there are these, um, there are beliefs and policies and actors that are creating a system of the prison industrial complex. And that is what we need to be um, organizing against. Um, so what is abolition? Now we know now that we're not just prison abolitionists, but we are prison industrial complex abolitionists. Um, and what does that mean? It means two things. It means that we uh, see a vision of a world where we're not using cages in order to solve problems, um, but we're creating the resources that our communities actually need to be healthier. And it is also a political strategy that we use where we are shifting um, more resources into our communities and away from state and corporation sanctioned violence and social control. There's a great quote from Marianne Kappa actually here on the right that, um, that talks more about that too, that it's not just about um, demolishing, but it is also about building. So we'll talk a little bit about the connection here between the PIC and slavery. Um, Oh, and by the way, I know we're going through this very quickly. There's a video I didn't even show on one of the slides because we don't have too much time, but I did share the slides um, in the chat. So uh, please feel free to go at them at your own pace um, and review all of the resources that are linked in here. Um, so what is the connection between the prison industrial complex and slavery? Well, it's very complex. Um, I'm curious here, I wonder if people have heard of the 13th Amendment um, you can you can raise your hand or give a give an emoji if you've heard of that before. Great. So it sounds like some folks have, um, and it's really just a small piece of the connection. Um, basically, following uh, the the emancipation from slavery, there was a transition where um, you know, state sanctioned violence of policing, prison surveillance. Um, really institutionalized the same racism that was there during slavery. Um, the 13th Amendment states that slavery is abolished except in response to crime, crimes determined by the state. And that if someone has committed a crime, they could be, um, they could become a slave and then be forced to work for the profit of others for the state or corporation. Um, but there were other parts too. There were these racist black codes. They're the Jim Crow laws um, that determine what black people can do where they can be. There is the evolution of slave patrols into our current day police forces. Um, and there's been other, various other things along the way that have also created the very complex system that we know now as the PIC. And, and that is why we say that the most important word in PIC is complex. <laughs> um, and we know it's not just reforming the 13th Amendment. It's not just reforming uh, the laws. It's not just reforming the, the police forces, but there, there's going to be a number of different you know, policies and also building of things that we need to do in order to fight um, uh, this state sanctioned racism, classism, you know, heterosexism, xenophobia um, that has resulted in people being put into cages. Um, another thing to remember is that even during slavery times, um, people were disempowered. 
they weren't only forced to work for others, but they did not have power themselves. And, and that is still the case now with imprisonment. Imprisonment commonly doesn't mean that someone is being forced into slavery or forced to work for the profit of others. In fact, most of the time, people are not allowed to work. They're kept idle, they're separated from their communities. Um, when they come out, they might not be allowed to participate in society in various ways, um, from being denied jobs to being denied the right to vote. Um, so all of this is about disempowering folks, um, just as in slavery times. Okay, and there's another connection that we'll bring up, which is about this term, abolitionist. So we use this word abolitionist now, and it was used during when, when slavery was um, so legal in many more ways. Uh, and it was because at that time, there were people who said slavery can still exist. In fact, it is so difficult to change slavery. It is so difficult to, um, uh, to dismantle something that's been integrated into our economy and our lives. Uh, and so why don't we just make it a little bit better? Why don't we just have people have nicer places to live and better health and um, not be beaten? But slavery abolitionists said, that's not gonna work. Slavery is wrong. And um, if we want people to lead better lives, we need to not be enslaving them. And in our day, PIC abolitionists believe the same thing. And that's why we borrowed that term. Um, because we believe that we can't just make prison beds more comfortable. We can't just make prison a more comfortable place. There's no reforms that are going to make caging our community members a good thing for our society. Um, and even though the system, again, seems so big, it seems so integrated into our lives and to our economy, we still believe that it is outrageous and it is solvable. And so that is why, just as in those days, we believe it needs to be abolished. Yeah, thanks for all your, your quotes in the in the chat if you come in. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about how you can think about abolition in campaign work, how you fight up against it. Um, if you wanna see all the seven easy steps to abolition, you can click on the link here at the bottom to the abolitionist toolkit and review them all. But for the sake of time, we're only gonna talk about two today. We're gonna to talk about step one, which is about the life and scope. It means that we do not support any reforms that will extend the reach or power of the PIC. Um, we are only supporting things that will limit its life and limit its scope. And step three of the seven steps is that we work in coalition with others. We don't believe that we can do this alone. And there's so much work already being done on the ground. It also means that we, you know, sometimes our allies are at different places in their abolitionist journey. Um, but as long as we're supporting the same demand, um, we can work together. Uh, so we're going to talk about what that looks like in practice by looking at an example of a, a group that we supported um, and worked very closely in, um, which is the No New SF Jail Coalition. Um, so, First, we'll look at what we demanded. Um, we demanded things that limit the life and scope of the PIC in San Francisco. So that meant um, stopping a new SF jail from being built. Um, we did that successfully. And that meant that less people were then put into cages in San Francisco. We also um, advocated for legislation that would close a jail in San Francisco in this past. Um, so again, this meant less cages for people to be imprisoned in. And we advocated for lower budgets for the sheriff and the San Francisco PD. So more ways that we're limiting their power, limiting the people to be caged. Um, we also oppose things that would be more reformist. And the reason why is because we would just have to fight these later on. Um, even though they might seem like they make things a little bit better, there are things that eventually we would still have to dismantle because they still are increasing the power of the PIC. So this includes opposing expansion of electronic monitoring, which um, actually increased like 700% in San Francisco in the past few years. We oppose behavioral health justice centers, uh, which are basically jails for people with behavioral health needs with a different name. 
Um, we oppose law enforced, enforcement assisted diversion, which even though diversion is the name in the name, still left power in police officers hands. And so it's giving them um, more justification for having larger budgets, for having greater control over people's lives and for determining who can and who can't um, be offered freedom. So here's some um, practical examples we want to share with you. Um, now I'm going to hand it off to uh, to Nick to talk about a current campaign, Close CA Prisons, and wait for you to get involved in abolition locally. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Shiva. That was great. Um, I always love hearing from other folks in CR because I get to hear how y'all talk about it as well because, you know, we're all saying it in different ways, but this is awesome. Um, yeah, but I'm here ready to talk about our Close California Prisons campaign, which we're working in conjunction with the, with CURB, which is a statewide coalition. It's called California's United for a Responsible Budget. And you can go to the next slide, Jeeva. And this is a campaign we've just started. This is what we decided to um, tackle after um, closing 850 Bryant and, you know, the OSF jail coalition is doing great, doing their work right now. So we decided we want to work on another campaign. And this is um, a really, close campaign to critical resistance because critical resistance, one of the first campaigns we were ever part of was trying to stop the Delano II construction in the 90s. And that was to, um, at that time, and you can see in this timeline that California was building prisons at like, I mean, you can see between 75 and 2005, how many prisons were built at this time. And so critical resistance was like one of the first orgs that started with um, a bunch of other folks up and down the state to push back against the idea of imprisonment and that it was all right. And that's really like where critical resistance was born. And so now here we are in 2021 and the state is actually talking about closing prisons. So they were talking about closing two and we want them to close more. But anyways, in this slide, it's talking about how we have the Califos and prison room, but also at the same time, you know, the prison boom was happening it was catalyzed by greater policing, there's greater unemployment, there's longer sentences, the low cost of land because of um, disin disinvestment in farming, and then struggling um, inland economies because of the farming was, was going away, and then problematic investment vehicles. So prison construction was being um, funded by the taxpayer. So the you know, taxpayers are paying for all these prisons to be built and economies are essentially being built around um, imprisonment when you know, farming started to dry up, unfortunately, because of environmental um, issues, such as the droughts that have been happening. Um, next slide, please. And so here goes into why we're fighting to close prisons now. So the Legislative Analyst Office, which is part of um, the governor's office, had actually released recommendations to close five prisons by 2025. Right now, there's only two that are slated for closure, um, and our coalition is pushing them to close 10 prisons by 2026. So um, right now, there's also the lowest population. So in the last slide, you could see that it was starting to go down. That was demonstrating the population is lowering, so there's less people being in prison, and that is because of, you know, so many campaigns and fights that have been going on to lower sentences, to fight back against three strikes laws, um, and to lower, um, to make things from felonies to misdemeanors, so, you know, there's less people being locked up. Um, and then most importantly, our communities continue to be harmed by prisons, so we know that now we need to close it. The, you know, there's a little bit opening now, so we're ready to just run in and open that up even more. Um, next slide, please. And so here's Curb, the People's Plan for Prison Closure. Um, this calls for closure of 10 prisons. It's been, um, we want directly impacted people to be included in the prison closure process. So not just, um, you know, nonprofits or legislators, we want to hear impacted people and what they want to see happen in this prison closure. Uh, we want complete shutdowns and not warm shutdowns. So that means that we want, you know, no one to be housed, nobody to be working there, nobody to be being trained in these facilities. We want them gone. Like we do not want them to be around at all. 
um, and not simply a budgetary concern. And we surveyed people inside for the top criteria for closure. Um, one was unsafe health conditions. So you got water contamination, poison, asbestos, now COVID-19. Um, two, most overcrowded prisons. Three, the cost of the incarceration. Four, location of the prison and distance from loved ones. And then five, highest number of homicides and suicides. So these were the, the top five criteria that people inside were saying you should decide which prisons close first. Next slide, please. And so the campaign now. So Newsom has named two prisons for closure, DVI Prison in Tracy, which is closing in September, and then CCC, which is the California Correctional in Susanville, which is closing June 2022. And right now we're building more and more of a network. We're trying to, you know, we're, we're talking about vast space. You know, California is huge and we're really trying to build power within the Central Valley. So we're looking for supporters across different sectors, including labor unions and people in the Central Valley where these prisons are located to really hear from them what their communities need to break away from, you know, having to rely on prisons and um, being ready for these closures to happen as well, because we have to think of the impacts of those inside, but also the communities around them. And next slide. And then here's some ways to get involved. So getting involved with the Closed California Prisons Campaign, there's a form you can fill out and we'll share that with y'all. And then get involved with CR Oakland. We have our intro to abolition workshops. We have two workshops in a cohort nationally and there's a way to sign up and we'll drop that link. And it's also, if you have the slides, you can click through in the links. And then we also have a virtual volunteer night where we um, run our mail program and it helps us respond to mail from people in over 40 states. And you can email our email right there, which is croakland at coderesistance.org to get a Zoom link to those nights. And it's Tuesday nights and it's all remote. So you can, so people will come and drop off like letters if you want to scan. Um, if there's already, if you want to respond, there's scan letters that can be sent to you. And then somebody can come pick them up and mail them off for you. So in the last year, we've uh, really built up the this um, amazing remote way of doing our mail program, which we actually borrowed from uh, an example that our Portland chapter had done. Um, and so that's where we've done that cross organizing as well. And then we have a couple of group discussion questions on the side because we were thinking um, about how community colleges get involved. So the community colleges, their connections between for this prison closure campaign is that um, you know, in these in these towns, there's community colleges and prisons, and you'll see a lot of the times that the community colleges are the ones who are, um, you know, providing the classes on how to become a correctional offer, officer, and essentially like being used to professionalize these these things. But also, you know, the colleges, it's not like the colleges are super invested. It, they are in a way because they're connected, but also, you know, if the economy is going to change, the school can change with it. You know, we're starting to see in Susanville their president of their college talking about like, you know, we're, you know, we don't want to see more people in prison, but also if all these jobs go away, like who's going to come to our classes? We've already built this up, up this curriculum. So what's going to happen? So, you know, they're thinking in terms of students and seats means money. And so like, how can we be like, okay, well then now let's teach green jobs. Let's teach, you know, other different um, um, labor sectors. So that's where, you know, they could hear from the students and the students could tell them what they wanna learn instead of having to like learn just like the curriculum that is there, which is correctional officer curriculum. So there's definitely ways that um, the community college students have power to shift and change, you know, what's being taught and what job, job markets will be there for them afterwards. And I believe that's it for us. So, so now we are going to introduce my man, Smart Keys, for the California Union. Sorry. Go ahead, Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go for it. Just Hi, everyone. So, we're going to have Marquis to here, who will be speaking on behalf of California Media Action, and they'll be discussing the Media Abusha Mall alongside with the political prisoners as well. Go ahead, Marquis. 
Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Marquise, and thanks for the awesome introduction, Sean. Um, and yeah, I, um, I get to work with a wonderful crew of people, um, of abolitionists. Um, <laughs> hey, everybody. And um, yeah, just taking up the cause of Mumia. Um, and of course, because of that, you know, taking up the cause of all political prisoners, right? Um, and understanding um, that their, their kidnapping is just the way to put down our resistance. Um, so yeah, I'm here um, definitely to speak as a sharer of knowledge, not as an expert. Um, and just in the spirit of abolition, talk about, um, yeah, just a key figure in that in, in abolition, in abolition theory, a person who's in the belly of the beast, who contributes a significant amount of writing to um, to abolition. So yeah, um, who am I here to speak about? Um, Mumia Abujma, we all know that. Um, he is much more than a um, a kidnapped person. Um, he is a prolific writer, um, a sharer of history, um, a keeper of history, um, is what I like to think of him as, um, a warrior in the belly of the beast. Um, um, the case of Mumia is definitely deeply disturbing. Um, it's internationally recognized as a miscarriage of justice, right? Um, of course, Black people have always been subjected to kangaroo courts, right? Um, but um, yeah, this is extreme, uh, uh, especially um, just bothersome, right? Um, his case is like rife with um, just fake evidence, um, forced, um, forced witnessing, Right, like people, um, like officers literally lying about um, confessions. Um, yeah, at the center of his guilty verdict is literally a woman who um, said that they were forced to testify um, and say that they watched um, a Mumia murder, murder a police officer. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's uh, enough said. Um, I'm gonna drop some resources um, in the chat. I'm gonna ask everyone to pull out their favorite note-taking app and um, just write down a few links, a few places where you can um, learn more, learn specifics about how um, Mumia was denied a fair trial um, and then eventually um, given the death penalty. Um, and yeah. Um, um, I'm also not gonna name the um, the fallen uh, slave capture uh, and enslaver, because um, we don't care about them. <laughs> um, I just want to kind of go through the political climate too. Um, we know the case of Mumia was a complete mistrial. Um, why was it a mistrial? Um, as we all know, America has never been good um, to POC. Um, it's always seen us as a laboring force, as of people that can be displaced, stolen from, and used um, without care for our our needs. Um, and um, yeah, of course, that's why we are always subjected to unfair trials. Um, but you know, let's get into specifics. Um, uh, the judge um, that presided over um, Mumia Abu Jamal's uh, trial um, was literally caught. Um, by a court stenographer saying that um, he was going to help the prosecutors fry the N-word. Um, like key evidence was withheld, like how many people were present at the scene and potential other suspects, not that they deserve to go to jail or prison or yeah. Um, and just, um, yeah, literal like the denying of um, Mumia Abu Jamal's like uh, constant requests for like funding to have to be able to afford um, to get evidence um, or just his requests for like representation all denied um, 
the court, uh, not even the court, but the prosecutors even did stuff like um, pick specific jurors, um, jurors that basically weren't young and black um, that they thought would basically be more likely to, to pass the capital, um, capital um, pass the death penalty as the sentence for Mumia. So yeah, just a total, just literally an entire system at every level conspiring to take down Mumia and just completely sanctioned um, from the federal level down to like that local court, um, down to the prosecutors and even Mumia's um, forced defense. Um, we also know that at the time, um, um, Black, um, uh, people who were basically for Black liberation um, um, and just resisting the conditions that Black people were subjected to were under constant and incessant attack. Um, uh, forgive me again if, um, if, if anybody's being traumatized by this, um, please take a break. Um, you know, yeah, I, I completely understand if you need to. Um, but yeah, we know at the time um, the MOVE org was being attacked um, right, the move nine were kidnapped, right, after police, over militarized police showed up, right, and started a conflict over very petty, petty shit, which is what they always do. Um, you know, at the time, uh, uh, Hampton was, was assassinated, right, by the FBI. Um, Asada um, was basically fucked with at the time, excuse my language. <laughs> um, so yeah, we this is the climate, right? The our elders are the people who taught us so much. We're we're just under attack. The people who just wanted a different world. Um, yeah, we're under constant attack. Um. So yeah, Muya um, basically um, was handed down the death penalty, and this was overturned um, to life in prison. Um, and Mumia is still fighting to have a fair trial, to have a shot at being heard um, to this day. And that's why um, we're here, right? We're the outside voice that keeps that alive. We are um, the people who can't forget, um, which is what the system wants ultimately, right? It's just for us to just forget that this entire thing happened, this movement happened. Um, and yeah, they want our heroes to just be disappeared. Right. It's a tactic of most fascist states. Um, and um, that's something extremely powerful to me um, was just to hear one to hear about our elders, um, but then two to also understand that um, our elders are still here and that we can we can fight for them. And 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 that was pretty powerful that there's still a link. There's still a connection and that they are still um, trying to talk to us, right? Um, and at the end of this, also um, drop some resources on how you can hear um, our ancestors, right? How you can, um, yeah, uh, help them be heard. Um, yeah. So I think that um, uh, Mumia's, um, I think that Mumia's um, kidnapping, um, has a lot of ties to um, carceral capitalism, right? Has a lot of ties to, um, yeah, just the prison industrial complex. Um, I, I really was digging the presentation before that just kind of explained um, the role of prisons historically and, and that tie to capitalism, right? How um, a free black populace um, was, um, could no longer be enslaved and used like, you know, to generate ec ec economic, pro uh, economical product, right? Like legal legally, but there was a loophole in, in the 13th Amendment, right? Um, and just understanding that, yeah, most of, um, yeah, most of these prisons are, are from an expansion in prison. And that expansion in prison is tied to, um, to wanting to um, not fund um, schools or fund the things that we need, but instead um, invest in um, getting um, or forcing people to produce. Um, 
And um, I think there's just a very clear tie to, um, there's just a very clear um, profit um, incentive for mass incarceration. And, and so then it doesn't surprise me um, that Mumi is caught up in that, um, that a lot of our elders are caught up in that and forced into that. Um, hey, Marquis. Hey, hello. Hey, I'm so sorry. Um, th there's actually a glare from behind you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, just in case it um, might be troubling for people that had the trouble. Thank hey. you. Hey, folks. Can you all see me now? Perfect. Sweet. Nice. Oh, that window is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all good. Thank you so much, Marquis. Thank you all. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I think um, in the spirit of abolition, um, we need to tear down the system that punishes, hypercriminalizes, um, and then also profits off of that uh, and is based in profiting off of that. Um, and to do that is to, is to stand with the people inside, is to amplify voices like Mumia's um, and all the other imprisoned elders um, and imprisoned people. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah. So yeah, I just, just wanna share some more thoughts. I, I, it's always like um, bothered me how um, the move, the, these movements have always been criminalized. I mean, just even a, a post-Civil War, right the movement against um the, the 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 abolitionist movement right that's against slavery is penalized right black people are are punished for being free right with black codes and convict leasing right and then further punished after that um via segregation right and um and then punished after that on top uh, um, with with the expansion of um, uh, prisons, right? Prisons being built uh, after the Clinton era and um, right, three, star uh, three strike rules like the comrades earlier mentioned. Um, so just this constant expansion of prisons um, and corporations um, offering really shitty services, um, right? To profit off prisons uh, and expanding prisons. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we have to abolish, we have to fight for abolition. Um, we have to try to liberate our elders. Um, can um, everybody pull up their favorite note um, taking app? I have some information I want to share. Um, another thing is I really want to inspire you all to, to tap in and try to connect, um, connect with, um, some of our elders who are imprisoned, like um, figure out ways to, to talk to them, write letters, um, join your local group um, and just vouch for folks to be released because there's so many folks sitting in, in prison right now um, or in jails, just incarcerated for nothing and some just waiting, at least just waiting for a fair trial, right? Because of the bail bond system. Um, so um, if you'd like to join um, the California Mumia Action, um, things that we do, um, we just put, we just turn the pressure on, right? We just don't forget um, the people inside. Um, so um, for example, um, the folks in the California Mumia Action were at the center of um, Black August protests, um, demonstrations in front of San Quentin, um, in memory of um, George Jackson and, um, you know, um, how they, uh, yeah, their entire story. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to join that, put your name in the chat, um, 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 preferably a way to contact you. Um, and I'll, I'll scrape all that up and get you connected. Um, and other things you can do um, if you have your notepads up. Um, is follow prisonradio.org and donate to them. Um, Prison Radio is sick. They have 
um, they have they they just keep um, keep keep me connected and, and a lot of people connected to um, what's going on inside our elders and uh, Mumia uh, Mumia Mumia constantly um, contributes to that to Prison Radio. Um, so I'll type that in the chat real quick for us. All right. Um, I'd also um, check out Let Mumia Out um, if you want to contribute to that struggle specifically. Um, there's on, on letmumiaout.com, um, there's uh, a pretty nice assortment of ways to connect with um, politicians in Philadelphia and put the pressure on them. Um, um, politicians like Larry Krasner, Philadelphia's DA, um, or uh, Tim Wolf, the governor. Um, and there's also a script you can um, follow, um, not too closely, it's a little bit outdated. Um, um, but yeah, um, that's another way that you can get involved um, by just putting on some pressure, organizing the people around you um, to help do that, just maybe consistently scheduling time to just pressure, pressure politicians um, and just keep that name alive. Um, and then there's um, just an article I want to share with folks um, about the mistrial of Mumia. Um, and that's also the last link. And I hope that you all um, just do your, do your part um, join your local struggles um, for abolition. Keep the people, um, keep the people who are in their their name alive. Understand that, yeah, um, a lot of them are in there for nonviolent um, shit, um, victimless crimes, right? Um, um, work with um, um, work with orgs, especially all the orgs that are here today. Like tap in with them. Um, because, yeah, it, it can't end with this. Like, this is just the beginning. This is just the information. Um, and we have to organize ourselves and get plugged in. Um, that's the, the best advice I can give. Thank you. All righty. Thank you, Marquis, for California Media Action. And thank you, um, Critical Resistance, as well. And thank you both. Right now, we are going to have a 10-minute break. Um, also, I want to apologize earlier for like me stumbling. It's just I'm in this sunset weather and it's hella muggy out here. So it's extremely <laughs> depressing. <laughs> I just, but yeah, so yeah, 10 minute break. Thank you all. Um, it's weird and I need it. I need it. Um, also, we wanted to ask if there was anybody that had any accessibility needs, you can go ahead and uh, chat, like send it via direct like chat so that we know, or you can like, like directly message one of us if there are any accessibility needs that people like need to know. Yeah, and if, if anybody has questions, just general questions as well during the break. Um, we will be checking the chat for that too. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But if you want
Right now, I okay. Hi, welcome back everyone. So we're going to start with our other speaker, Gloria Jimenez, who will be talking about the team views. Thank you so much, Gloria, for being here. Thank you. Um, let's see, and if you all can share my slides that I emailed in, thank you. Okay, okay. okay perfect. So hi everyone, my name is Gloria Jimenez Moran. My pronouns are she, her, and ella. I was born and raised in East Oakland, Ohlone occupied lands. Um, and today I will be presenting on La Migra y la Policia, La Misma Porqueria. Basically ICE and the police, the same shit. Um, and I also am also including ORR there and I'll explain what ORR is. 
Uh, just very straightforward, some trigger warnings. I will mention uh, psychological, emotional, medical, physical harm imposed on children and youth by ICE or are the government police both in the US and um, in other countries. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so brief outline, I'm going to be introducing myself and the social work attorney model that we work under and also providing a very important disclaimer. I'll be giving a very brief overview of the forcing, the forcing forces that push children and youth out of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, an overview of what immigration detention jails are like while centering the experience of a now a young adult, and hoping you all can see the similarities with the juvenile and criminal injustice systems, um, hence la migra y la policía la misma porquería. Next slide, please. Okay. So I am a social worker who works with, works with immigration attorneys. We work together in teams for and with children and youth detained by immigration in the custody of the Office and Refugee Resettlement, also known as ORR, um, upon entering the U.S. or after residing in the U.S. and coming in contact with ICE or Custom Border Patrol um, while undocumented and unaccompanied. ORR is part of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, through ORR, the federal government has the right to house, aka detain and jail children um, who are deemed undocumented and uh, unaccompanied in the U.S. ORR can and does contract with individuals, residential treatment programs, juvenile halls, all military bases like they tried in Mountain View, California just a few months ago. ORR basically allows for and oversees what I call ICE prisons for minors. It's just a different name, different funding. Um, they're not considered ICE facilities. And technically, they're supposed to be taking on a more child-friendly approach and always considering the least restrictive setting for children. Um, there is a deportation officer, immigration officer appointed to all children detained in these facilities. And there are different level of facilities. So there are some that, you know, there's the ratio of staff per youth can look very different depending on the level. Um, the lowest secure levels, there's more children, less staff. The higher you go, it's more staff less children, um, including up until a juvenile hall and residential treatment programs in hospitals. Where children are placed is determined by their behavior and disclosures. So for example, if a child discloses that in home country, they um, stole some food from time to time because they were in need, the government here might, might deem that as somebody who is in danger or a danger to society because they might do that here as well. Or if a child um, mentions that they in home country experienced harms in the hands of a gang, the government here deems them a danger, um, potentially being somebody who is associated with a gang, right? So everything that a child discloses can and will be used against them, as in um, when, when children and youth are detained by the police. In my role, I provide know your rights. So I inform children of their rights while they're detained. I do conduct legal screenings, follow-ups to inform children of the legal relief options that they are eligible for here in the United States um, in order to, at some point, um, receive their residency and citizenship if possible and if eligible. I also conduct pre-release know your rights um, and work on applications and accompany children to court and interview. So I do also inform children of their rights upon and if released from these facilities. If the children that we are working for um, don't have family in the US and nobody is able to sponsor or put up a plan for them to house them, we do work on a plan to, for them to be released into the community um, and we will continue representing them. Uh, we do represent the child's stated interest, which at times can conflict with, white, white, with what white supremacy has labeled best interest. Um, I do need to provide a very important disclaimer, as I mentioned, being licensed in California as a clinical licensed social worker, I am considered a mandated reporter, which many social workers, including myself, are, call are calling for the abolishment of, as it is another form of policing, terrorizing, and separating families. Um, I, myself, and my colleagues, we have this um, technique, or not technique, sorry, we go around it by basically children and youth can whenever we're very open about who is a mandated reporter and who isn't, attorneys are not. And so children can consult with the attorney prior to disclosing anything to me and they will talk through if I will, if there's any mandated reporting or not, or I give the children and youth um, the option to talk to me in scenarios, third person hypotheticals, and then we will work towards what their goals are and try to um, always prioritize their needs and wants versus mandated reporting. But this is something that, um, 
we do because we do believe that children and youth have the right to choose how their information and disclosures are further shared or not. Uh, next slide, please. So why do, oh, sorry, go ahead. So why do children and youth migrate? Um, so I primarily work for children and youth that are considered um, from where what is considered the Norton Triangle. So that's El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala. Some very brief background, like super quick, uh, just so people can get an idea as to even just like maybe potential country conditions. Um, these three countries have been known to be used as military bases um, by the US. US war funded wars have taken place there. Um, the consequences of those wars continue to be felt there up until today. The US has caused displacement in the US in those countries and continues to take resources, destabilizing the economy there um, while also pushing out individuals from the US who have suffered psychological distress in the hands of the US, including US prisons and US, US formed gangs. Um, so not only is the US taking so much from these countries, they're also doing so while, while pushing people back to situations of unrest. This doesn't mean that the community is there. Um, sorry, I, I'm getting like a comment in the section area, but. isn't to the nose. Um, so it was somebody asking you explicitly state why you're against mandated reporting. Um, so I, I believe that the way that it, it's set up, uh, mandated reporting usually leads to further harming the youth, not necessarily taking their best interests and needed interests in mind, and mostly taking into into account what white supremacy has labeled best interest. So they don't take account um, trauma, um, cultural differences, family needs, um, community resources or not, et cetera. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, um, but let me know if you have more around that. I just do believe that the social work field, the social work field was the way it's rooted and it was constructed, it was still holding white supremacy and there's, we, we need to acknowledge that and, and really um, find a way where that's not, that's not happening, right? Like how do we abolish uh, white supremacy in the social work field? How do we come up with solutions where mandated reporting doesn't lead to a child being removed immediately without taking into account um, everything that the family or the youth might need? Okay, so. Sorry, as I was saying, um, everything that I mentioned in terms of the conditions of um, children and youth, why they're migrating from these countries, that's not to say that communities in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala are not thriving in culture, nurture, et cetera, but definitely the U.S. has not had the agenda to uphold what is thriving in these communities and instead has only inflicted generational tra trauma, pain, harm, and displacement. Um, with that being said, many children and youth, adults as well, but my focus is for children and youth, are left with little to no choice but to leave their home country in order to seek survival and a chance to basically find basic needs for themselves and their families, even if it's just food or labor or finance or medical treatment, etc. cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I mentioned unaccompanied minors. Um, so ORR, these ICE facilities for minors that are not I, technically, they're not um, labeled as ICE facilities, but that's what they are. Um, just as earlier, what was mentioned um, with some therapeutic programs is the same thing as jails, just with a different name, right? Um, the funding is different, but they house in jail unaccompanied and undocumented minors upon entering the country. So at the border, if they don't come with a parent or caregiver, although there's been cases too where a child enters the country with their parents and they're separated and parent is deported and the child is um, placed in these systems. Um, or also when ICE comes in contact with a child or youth in the US and the parent is not present during that contact, that doesn't mean that the parent might not be present in the US, but by contact, um, the parent is not there, and so they are transferred to these facilities. Very important um, thing too that I want to emphasize is that there needs to be a big shift in terms of this label of unaccompanied minors. Um, the U.S. forces children to be unaccompanied, right? So we, we, these children and youth, they don't choose to be unaccompanied. They are forced 
to leave their family behind or if you know they didn't have family behind was it tied to U.S. forces disrupting everything that's going on in their countries right so the U.S. really disrupts a lot of peace resources and many possibilities of safely obtaining basic needs um, and language can really place the accountability or not on the acting forces of oppression that creates migration. Um, I mentioned also that like ICE can come in contact with a child or youth in the US. So we saw this a lot back in 2007 when there were raids in New York, New Jersey, um, when the police and ICE were collaborating. And they were basically just um, in the streets picking up any child that looked undocumented that look like a gang member um, and then would take transfer them to, to ICE custody and into these ORR facilities. So some of those youth actually had their parents in the US. They were not unaccompanied. ICE made them unaccompanied when they decided to place them in these facilities, right? So just like really considering language. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So what are children and youth met with in ORR, um, the US? So I'm gonna be sharing part of a letter of a youth drawings and the story of a now young adult. Um, he's 20 years now and he entered the US when he was about 16. He actually was really, really hyped that I was doing this with you all. And he wanted me to share his experience. Like he wanted me to tell his story. Um, I did change his name. I'm not gonna be providing identifying information, but he, um, navigated me um, as to like what I should be saying today or not. Um, what this child experienced is very common um, in, in ICE facilities and in ORR in the US. It's very, what he experienced is very, very common in the immigration system. Again, I wanna give a trigger warning. There will be mention of psychological, emotional, medical and physical harm imposed on children and youth by ORR and ICE um, throughout uh, everything that I will be explaining, especially towards the end. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the youth Oscar that I'm going to be speaking about, um, he, this is the last, one of the last letters that he wrote to me while he was in ICE adult custody. Um, it says, pero la verdad no me toca de otra, but the truth is I have no other choice. Sí, la verdad me duele mucho llegar a mi país y solo llevar dolores de cabeza a mi familia. Pero no hay problema, Dios sabe lo que hace. Yes, the truth is it hurts a lot returning to my home country and only bringing headaches to my family. But it is not a problem. God knows what he is doing. Así como llegué a este país, así mismo me voy sin nada. A lo mejor Dios tiene algo preparado para mí en mi futuro. Just how I came to this country, I similarly leave with nothing. Maybe God has something prepared for me, for my future thought, sorry. Um, okay, next slide. So Oscar fled his home country, Honduras, around the age of 14, 15, after the local police and the gang almost killed him in different occasions claiming he must or should be a gang member because of the neighborhood he grew up in. So the neighborhood he grew up with and um, there was, he was in between two different gangs. And so they, the gangs that controlled that area. And so both gangs claimed and alleged that he must be an informant for the other or, or somehow related to the other because he was not trying to join either. Um, and then the police because of where he lived also claimed that he, he must be a gang member if he's from that area. They harassed him verbally as well, stating that they knew his father had been killed in earlier years and therefore he was not important and had no one to take care of him. His father had been killed when Oscar was younger. It is believed that it was potentially by law enforcement, um, but there was no um, inv investigation that happened. At the age of 14, a local gang kidnapped Oscar and forced him, forced a tattoo on him. Um, Oscar knew he had to leave or he would be killed for sure with the tattoo. Uh, next slide, please. When coming to the U.S. and crossing through Mexico, a cartel kidnapped him and physically abused him after he could not get the money that they were asking of him. He was able to escape um, after some months of being kidnapped. Entering the U.S., he was detained and labeled a gang member by Customs and Border Patrol and ORR, given the disclosure of the life-threatening experiences in Honduras. So the government, CBP, ORR, ICE, they all do this often. They interrogate children 
interrogate children and youth. And if a child or youth shares anything in relation to a gang or cartel, they will state that the child themselves are a danger to society. They will deny the child release to their family or friend, claiming that they need to further assess and study the child and youth to see what their intentions in the US are. Never have I seen the US government or immigration take accountability for the fact that gangs exist in Honduras and other countries because of the US. Never have I seen the government or ICE recognize that systems of power exist and many times leave children and youth with few to no options when having to ensure their survival and cope. Or are denied Oscar release for over a year with no care as to how the tension was deteriorating his mental health and impacting the trauma inflicted on Oscar since a very young age. Their goal was to ensure this child was not a danger to society without allowing him to be in society. Oscar experienced severe symptoms of anxiety, PTSD, depression, which increased, increased with the months. Most of his days, he was forced to be in the room as a form of punishment for not wanting to participate in group activities or therapy. The government labeled him non-compliant and unable to work with. Oscar was detained, was detained in multiple facilities across the U.S. So this happens often as well. Children are bounced around from facility to facility across the U.S., um, including a juvenile hall that contracts to house children and youth detained by immigration. Um, he experienced physical and emotion, em, emotional abuse from the facility staff and medical neglect as well. I remember he had reported pains in the stomach and need for eyeglasses and that was never checked, for example. There was a point where the staff at a facility attempted to press charges against Oscar after Oscar acted in self-defense when the facility staff punched Oscar. Oscar was consistently given medication to sleep and the dosages were changed regularly. Parental and caregiver med medical approval is not needed for medication and psychiatric services while detained in ORR immigration as a minor. Upon being transferred to a facility in California, I finally met Oscar. He had already been detained for over a year and his 18th birthday was coming up. We worked on and submitted his asylum application. Asylum is a legal relief option, option um, available for individuals who fear returning to their home country. Um, and it was really hard for him to engage in this. And I see this also a lot that when children are detained, um, you know, they, they experience trauma, they experience prolonged relief, I mean, prolonged detention that impacts their ability to even engage in their legal case, even though they know that that's what might allow them to stay in the US and not return to their home country. He was also very distrusting, very distrusting of adults in general in the US because many had put their hands on him while in these facilities. So while we attempted to support his stated interest as much as possible, the government denied, um, sorry, so we attempted to, to support his best interest, I mean, his stated interest as best as possible. And one of those stated interests was getting the tattoo that he had received um, by force in Honduras removed. And the government here denied that even after I found the program that was willing to do it for free, um, stating that it wouldn't be enough time for Oscar to, to complete the program. Um, to get the tattoo removed, even though he had already been detained for over a year and he had been asking for that. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Oscar was released to his cousin in Arizona a few days before his 18th birthday. I also see this a lot, that the government will prolong the detention up until close to when the youth turns 18. Um, upon being released to his cousin, Oscar started experiencing what appeared to be anxiety and panic attacks. He said he would wake up in the middle of the night crying. Um, his cousin kicked him out of the house after Oscar started to self-medicate. Being kicked out, he experienced homelessness. He had no phone, no contacts. He wasn't even allowed to take his things. In the streets while trying to best, his best to survive, he met someone who offered him housing and a job. Oscar reconnected with me and I was able to refer his case to local attorneys. Um, since he's out of the state, I wasn't able to continue working with him in, in the legal perspective of his case. Um, a few months after Oscar was arrested for, um, he, a, so a colleague of his, a coworker of his, of his sorry, um, apparently had been expressing very anti-immigrant sentiments to him and called the police on Oscar. And he was charged with possession of marijuana. Um, after serving his time, he was supposed to be released and placed on the ankle monitor, but instead he was picked up by ICE and transferred to an ICE jail um, in a different state. Um, so this is also, it was mentioned earlier, like the profit, right? Um, ICE 
jails will contract with ICE, prisons will contract with ICE in order to get that funding. Um, so I do believe it is a, a financial incentive, which is really disgusting that the jails and the prisons um, continuously are perpetrating. Um, about two months later, Oscar got in touch with me. So I, I wasn't aware that this was happening at that point. And he got in touch with me after he was able to get my number by his mom, through his mom, I mean. Um, his previous attorneys weren't able to continue representing him given that he was out of their state. And so we were able to connect Oscar with other attorneys that were able to represent him for free. Um, however, we, we went for a bond hearing and he was denied release. Again, ICE alleging Oscar was a gang member and now possibly a drug dealer given the arrest. Oscar fought, he fought hard for himself for a year. We, he prepared for his asylum case and he did his best to keep his mind grounded. There was a lot of back and forth as to who had jurisdiction over his case and um, who was to handle the asylum application. In ICE custody, Oscar was often taken to the hole or isolation um, for getting into arguments with staff that threw, threw him his food to his face and denied him phone calls, even to me, his legal team. After almost a year in ICE custody, Oscar signed for removal. He said he could no longer take it. He said he knew he would most likely be killed upon returning to home country, yet he was slowly dying here anyways in a cell. Next slide, please. Oscar was deported to Honduras February of this year. Upon arriving at the airport in Honduras, he was arrested by the police there and they claimed that he must be a gang member if he had been deported by the United States. He was released to his family after his family paid the police um, the amount that they were asking for. Oscar attempted to leave Honduras. Um, in late March, I got a call from Oscar's mother. She said that he had been shot multiple times by unknown individuals suspected to be the police collaborating with the local gang. Oscar survived, the others who were with him did not. Oscar was hospitalized and with time, he was able to slowly start walking again. He hid for months while recovering um, in different homes, which two, two homes that he hid in were also shot at, missing Oscar both times. Mid-August, Oscar left Honduras and made his way to Guatemala, hoping to get to Mexico and reside there. Just last week, he called me, he made it to Mexico and he had connected with an attorney there who was hoping to represent him, but Oscar was very distressful. Um, he also called me and wanted to let me know if this presentation had already happened. And I told him that he was a few weeks ahead, um, but that I was definitely gonna be talking about his case. Um, so Oscar feels that his life was dehumanized in the US. And while detained in ICE custody, I remember he would read a lot of books about the history of the US in which he was able to understand that even when he was in Honduras, the U.S. was playing a role in his life already, like prior to him even coming to the U.S., um, prior to him being detained here, prior to him being deported. Oscar's story is not an isolated incident, and that is exactly why he wanted me to share his story. Many children and youth experience similar torments in the name of the U.S. government. The U.S. government, ORR, ICBP, whatever they want to call themselves, and the police use very similar punitive tactics on children and youth when they don't comply with the set agenda, court orders, etc., which those that agenda can be so far removed from what the child and the youth needs and wants. Immigration and the police use the same language to describe our loved ones and deem them unworthy. They take what are normal age activities and normal trauma responses and label the child a danger. The police and ICE are both utilizing alternative models to detention, like the ankle monitor, etc., as a way to control and continue dehumanizing our children and youth. And I do want to point out, because Oscar also mentioned this and he noticed it, was that these systems target children and youth of Black and African descent more heavily. Um, and, and many individuals that work with the population detained by RRR will, will tell you that children and youth of Black and African descent report experiencing higher levels of abuse, experience longer periods of detention, are given higher bonds, are less likely to even have their legal cases approved. Okay, next slide, please. So that was a lot, that was a lot, right? And I think um, with sharing Oscar's story, like even myself, there was moments where I felt hopeless um, in terms of how, how, what, what can I do next? Um, and there's different ways we can get involved. There's different 
lanes for everyone. Not everyone's going to be doing the same exact work and that's okay. And we need that. We need people to be, you know, hitting the abolishment movement from different angles, um, aiming for the same, for the same results. You know, there's ways that you can get involved with funding the police in, in your own city and city council and budget meetings, signing on petitions when community members are, are asking for their release from ICE um packing up the courts virtually when when there's court hearings right um making those calls to transfer um to stop the transfers from prisons to ice um, because they do work and i've seen them making those calls to end contracts with ice like new jersey they just did that um and so their state and their state ice can no longer extend or create new ice contracts um, with the prisons there accompany individuals to check ins um at immigration for their status and and this is something that you would have to get training for, but there are organizations and I will, the next slide will show that, but it's also contacting local legal offices and seeing like, hey, like if there's youth coming to school with ankle monitors, how do we get involved in making sure that that can be removed ASAP, right? Um, and also one thing that a youth mentioned to me was like, be kind to anyone who may not know the language or how to fill out an application or anything, anything, just like be kind, right? Like kindness can really go a long way for people. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then these are some of the orgs that I would say really, really um, encourage everyone to follow. Um, these are their Instagram accounts. Um, they do a lot of work with, in terms of abolishing the prisons, juvenile halls, um, ICE, alternatives to, to um, the prison system, et cetera, um, and really trying to reshift and the, what every imagining safety can look like in our communities. Okay, so that is it. I know that was a lot and there, there, there might have been a lot of triggers and I do want to apologize if there was any miscommunication, especially about the discussion at the beginning. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, shit. Thank you very much for uh, all the information. Like that was very, very helpful. Um, I wanted to make a personal comment, right? Like, and it's no shade to you, first and foremost, like, but I'm very against uh, the mandated reporting that social workers have to do. As a child, I was very, like, much victimized by that. There are things that I had said that was used and, like, that was, like, made way larger than need be. And, like, I was separated from my own family right, for a, a, like a very long period of time. So the, only that aspect of it was very triggering. And like I said, it's not like not to discredit any of the like amazing, amazing work that she did, right? And the fact that she had like brought this person's story, you know, I, I just want to sit there and mention that, but like I am very much against mandated reporting. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I agree, I agree there has to be a way that these mandate, mandated systems don't exist because it's the same shit. It's the same shit that leads to like family separation, labeling children, um, really working on like that. Sorry, what was that? I was just going to add to what you were saying, imprisonment as well. I yes. didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It works on this like whole like best interest, like whose best interest? Like what is the stated interest? What is needed? What is wanted? Um, so I, I definitely agree. And I, I thank you for sharing your own personal experience. Yeah, boom. And when you said whose best interest, it's white supremacy's best interest, you know, and white supremacy's best interest is to break up and disrupt like people of color in any way that is possible. Like when you were sitting there saying that a lot of like um, um, a lot of the people in these detention centers are black kids, you yeah. know, like it's really systemic, like, and, like black people are poisoned at every level, like every at, single literally every fucking level, like every level whether it be music and tv whether it be the fact that there's nothing there's no healthy food in your neighborhoods whether it be that you are set up to fail by you know, like with the schools that you go to you know like balboa hot bow versus gal you know there's a huge difference between bow and gal you know what i mean like the schools like the areas so yeah thank you thank you very much and i can tell that you're very much against that as well and you know, like you're just in a really shit position. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. And then if you want to introduce Ida. Okay, so next we'll be having uh Ida Gray, who is a formerly incarcerated. 
uh, McCray, I'm sorry, Ada McCray, who is a formerly incarcerated health educator at City College, who will talk about abolition at City College. Thank you so much for being here. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, it's an honor to be anywhere, okay? Indeed. Simply in the live and in the flesh, it really is. Um, and I just want to... I just wanted to say thank you to Gloria for her beautiful uh, presentation and resources. And um, when I was thinking about how all of these systems of dehumanization, isolation, separation, or what I call the whole plantation theory, all right? It starts in first with the indigenous attempted annihilation, okay, because, you know, as indigenous people are still here, and the poisoning uh, that has continually and, 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 and mushroomed in so many different ways, whereas whether it's in Flint, Michigan, where uh, uh, Black children are being poisoned, or whether it's through our food, because I was just going the other day, I was just noticing something. I say, how come our African sisters and brothers from, from Haiti have such nice teeth? And I've been drinking this chloride mess and my teeth look like uh, I got to spend a lot of money on them. Well, guess what? We're still constantly being poisoned. We are continually being poisoned. And if you study history, if you study what happened, it's still happening. And in that, we have to become woke. When I mean woke, I mean aware. All right, okay. They started with uh, smallpox with the indigenous people. Uh, the Europeans brought them syphilis. Well, they've mushroomed to a whole lot of other types of diseases. And then, okay, let's, let's even go a little bit further when you talk about um, the plantation theory. What to, okay, you've gone from colony to corporation. Uh, and again, it's all under the, whole auspices of being colonized. So if you look at our roots, and, the, and when I say our roots, the world's roots, when someone was disruptive, they were annihilated, they were uh, put out, not uh, given the death penalty or shamed. Um, but in that, we have to come back to how we can build communities. One of the things I wanna mention, this is the 50th anniversary of Comrade George Jackson. A lot of you may not know who he is, but uh, Comrade George Jackson was murdered in San Quentin. And in that uh, was the Panther. And that's a lot of, I know a lot of you've heard the name of uh, Sister Angela Davis. And in that, um, this has been the 50th anniversary since uh, Marin County, um, where Jonathan Jackson, William Christmas, and others were trying to get their brother out of prison, which was George Jackson. A lot of us call him comrade. And coming up and growing up in the movement, and I say in the movement, there was a lot of, we didn't know about COINTEL, the counterintelligence program. What's the counterintelligence program? It's the same thing that's going on now under a different name. Uh, what it is, is infiltration, and it's how people were um, paid to be informants, whether it's for the FALN, for Fuerzas Amada de la Revolución, and we're talking about my Puerto Rican sisters and brothers um, that were have done an extraordinary amount of time. Some have been uh, released, for example, my comrade Delcia Pagan, and all this stemmed from Lolita Lebron. These are names of people that have been fighting the system. And in fighting the system, what we have more ways of communication now than we've ever had. And why are people so ignorant? How come people are not woke? Simply because we are being programmed to think and not know who our enemy is. When you don't know who your enemy is, you don't know who to fight. And in that, when I say who is and what is the enemy, I believe the enemy is the system. This is, system is rotten to the core. And in the words of my comrade sister, Pam Africa, this system, it needs to be torn down. Nowhere does it um, have any humanity or, uh, or uh, nurturing or trying to get to the next generation in a whole manner. 
whether it's you're talking about the child uh, so-called welfare system, it's not nothing welfare about it, it's another system. And another reason is why they keep them in, and I'll take questions too, because um, a lot of times when you people are talking, uh, you just tune out, but a lot of times when you're in the system, it's about the money, it's about Capitalism is not about the young and it's not about the old. It's about keeping you uh, a, a worker for the big C, the corporation. And in that, I've done, and I've been convicted for 20 years for air piracy that happened a little bit after the Marin County Courthouse. Because then when the Marin County police killed their own judge, I'm like, okay, all right, I understand this now. I understand this in a very, in, uh, in a way that they don't care who's in the way. Because when you move, they'll hire somebody who looks just like you, who will say yes and say, uh-huh, okay. In that, I just wanna go through the importance of community, the importance of having a track record with the people that you know, uh, to avoid infiltration and also to avoid um, what I call another everyday counterintelligence movement. And that is to destroy and have us not know who our enemy is. I'm gonna read a little short poem that was uh, in the book by the power of the people is the force of life because the people do have the power and the whole world is waiting on us. Here we are in San Francisco where they got Twitter, Facebook and they got every uh, uh, big social event and you got t eight to 10,000 people are homeless on the street. You know, there's something really wrong with that. There's something really, really wrong. But then uh, we talk about defund the, le the police, but it's not a defunding, they need to be abolished in the sense that there was a time, and I, I'm gonna tell you this um, because I've been able to live a few decades. And there was a time when you couldn't sell dope on the street, all right? There was a time when people in the community took care of the elders. There was a time right here in San Fran, San Fran and Francisco or San Francisco where the community looked out after each other. And in that, that was destroyed. And it was destroyed by social workers, um, the whole system of social work. If they found a man in your house or, or a man's clothes in your house, they'd kick you off. It's by capitalism. And capitalism has been the enemy. And I was in, in that, I, it's just so much more to remind. Um, I think about, what they're talking about, the refugees or people coming over. The slaves made this the richest country in the world. And if they didn't take care of us, who in the hell you think they're gonna take care of? They ain't gonna take care of nobody, okay? <laughs> and they don't mean to because it doesn't fit in capitalism. And I call it capitalism on steroids, on steroids that we have to know who our enemy is to direct where our energy should be in terms of fighting the system. I'm not even just talking about uh, abolition here at CCSF. I'm talking about the, the system itself. For example, I've worked uh, a lot of years uh, with, even after I was released from prison, um, I worked in uh, county jails. I said, how are you gonna leave from one prison and go into the county jail? But you know why? Because there may be somebody there I need to know or I need to talk to, or I can help enlighten and become woke become aware of all the things that, how did we get to this place where we're looking at uh, colonization and we're looking at hues of people. But I don't know if you got the memo, but it's not but one race and that's the human race. That's why they're not pulling uh, kidneys out of gorillas and giving them the human beings. Why? Because we are, <laughs> we have so much in common and so much alike. And again, it's uh, the common, Good. I want to read this short poem to you. This is by Bruce Sedale in 1976. Capitalism. Capitalism crept into my soul, lunging at my heart, digging into my throat and stabbing at my lungs. As the blood flowed, my heart refused to stop. My voice remained determined. Then capitalism lost its balance hopped into his Cadillac and retreated back to the police station. Hello, okay. Um, all over the world, 
everybody is looking for us to make that change. And I'm saying the change needs to start right here. When we talk about um, abolition, when we talk about who needs to be in prison, okay, I'm going to admit, maybe four to five percent of the people need to be isolated from other human beings. They do not need to be treated inhumanely. And I say this on the eve of one of my comrades who just got out of prison after 52 years, Paul Sinku Jones, 52 years, all right? And in that, I'm going to give you a little story. He was a driver in a house invasion where someone got murdered. But if you look at uh, what happened to the insurrectionists, and I put that in quote, uh, where there was death, none of them got a conspiracy charge for murder. Now, one thing you got to know in the state of California, and uh, if you are in uh, crime, when a person becomes uh, murdered, and even if you were outside, let's say we all went to the 7-Eleven. Okay, I'm going to the 7-Eleven. You go in the store. I'm sitting in the car. You kill the, something happens, and you kill the, uh, somebody at the 7-Eleven. Both of you get the same beef. But it didn't happen with the insurrectionists. You know why? Because they're white. Everyone who entered there should have gotten a conspiracy to murder because police officers and other people protecting it should, were, were, uh, were murdered. So everybody walked in there. They shouldn't have got a few months, but still right here to, in California, who incarcerates more people, I think, than anywhere in the world between, I don't know, it was California or Texas, uh, which it stands in line in terms of incarcerating people. They got different strokes for different folks. And it all comes down to who you are, where you come from, and how the media is telling you who to think uh, uh, as to um, who to hate and who not to, not hate. I don't call it the fall of cabal, because after all, the Russians were in there and they didn't win. And, and, and Malcolm X said this a long time ago, the white man will never win a war on the ground. Now you see these uh, drones, you got people who say these drones come up and they can't even hit nobody, all right? So again, we have to consider wherever you go, whatever you do and whatever position you are, that your job should be to fight for the people because the people got the power. The power is with the people. And in that, uh, so many of these systems, and I I'm, uh, have worked a lot with, um, social workers and uh, uh, CPS workers and, you know, and it's nothing protective about uh, what they do. So I don't, you know, I just break the rules, okay? Because <laughs> if you break the rules, oh, I'm sorry, so I don't know, they went that way, so I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I just <laughs> play dub sometimes because in protecting people, we, that's something we have to do in whatever job you are, protect the people and don't cause no harm. I'll give you another example. When we talk about um, and, um, the end, not only of the prison system, but the end of ignorance. I want you to be woke, all right? In that, if we look at our history, where we've come from, who we adore, what we don't adore, adore and what forces are coming into your ears, one of the things schools should do is help you to think, not nurture you to become a worker for the capitalist system that has not supported anybody but the 1%. How is it in a pandemic that uh, the, uh, this 1% got more money than anybody else and everybody else struggling in, in, in their house and people who don't know no better <laughs> are taking it out on other family members because they're not clear on who the enemy is. So if you don't get the one thing from what I'm saying, know your enemy and beware of uh, infiltration and others telling you to think. Now in that, um, again, Paul Senku Jones did 52 years because he was the driver, all right? And in that, it's no coincidence that a lot of uh, people who are still alive are being kicked to the curb from the prison industrial complex in, in the later years of their life. And in that, you've, you've taken a lot of the um, uh, of the fire, but a lot of them are still coming out with fire inside and fighting for their lives. 
So um, I just want to, you know, I want to take some questions too, but I'll just give you a little bit of history about me, who I am. I was born and raised in San Francisco. I, um, um, I first became curious when they had the rebellion on Third Street back in the 60s. I saw the police walk in, in formation and the National Guard walk in formation, clearing the streets. And then they try to go up in Hunters Point. But one thing about most of the women in Hunters Point came from the South and they had clotheslines. So when the police started running, they would get choked on them clotheslines, okay? Until they changed, they changed the whole uh, structure, uh, geographical stu structure of Hunters Point. Uh, so it could be more under surveillance. And then all of a sudden, here was a community of people that looked after other communities of people. Cause I've heard stories, my mama didn't whoop me, but I've heard stories about if you did something in, in, one, in one area of the projects, you'd get two whippings before your mama, <laughs> cause they looked out for each other because it was a community. But what happens when there is a community of people? It gets attacked and who attacks it? The system and the bootlickers. Yeah, because the system can't work without the bootlickers, all right? And the bootlickers perpetuate what the, the objective of the oppressor is. And they always get somebody who can infiltrate, somebody who may look like you. So you say, oh, that's comfortable. But if you look at every slave rebellion, it was portrayed by somebody who looked like them. So you got to stop looking at the cover of people in the way they look, but look like, you know, even um, King said, look at the heart of the individual, who they are, what they stand for, and what they'll do, because we cannot do this by ourselves. We cannot um, change the system or create any type of meaningful movement by ourselves. We need everyone on board, because why? It's all of us. It has to be all of us, whether we're talking about, um, I, I just want to give you another thing. You know, I have so many memories. There was a time when the Red Guard, Black Panthers, Brown Berets were unified right here in San Francisco. But now they got people so sick. Huh? I'm sorry, do you mind if we start our associate discussion at 7.55? Okay, well, what time is it now? Because, you know, uh, Okay. Uh, and in that, there was a unity among the Red Guard, the Black Panthers, and the Brown Berets. So these are Latinos, okay, uh, the Black Panthers, and, and the Red Guard were the Asian people. Uh, we were together. And in that, that was attacked. So um, I'm going to end, and I'm just going to tell you to know who your enemy is. Don't look at the book at the cover and remember the people have the power and we have to destroy this rotten ass system. Ashe. First of all, I wanna say Ashe right back to you and thank you. First of all, I am like, it's all, I, I love, thank, first of all, you're from the city, like, like and you're a black person from the city. And I, like, you know, you remind, like, and I, I mean this with no disrespect, but you remind me of an auntie. And when you sat there and you said that, like, in the projects and in Black areas, when you do something bad, you get, you get your ass whooped before you get to the house. That's a fact. Like, that, like, as, as a, like, young Black person, that is a fact. Like, I, I like, before you get to the house, you, you, you get wrapped up, so. Um, yeah. They, they destroyed a community and was purposeful. And people have to look at that and not think that people on the social media is their friends. We have to continue to swim upstream. And one of the things I did after serving 20 years in federal prison for the hijacking uh, earlier in the 70s, I'm your San Francisco hijacker, I left, and, is that I would jump in the Sacramento River, River sometime and just swim upstream. You know why? Because to remember how hard it is. I wouldn't get far, far. I mean, we only got a few feet, but I needed that to know it's a protracted struggle, just like Miles Satan. We have to continue. La luta continua. All right. And in that, we have to embrace each other and, and, um, and with kindness and in love and in nurture. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. Uh, and then another point, I also want to say we do need all of our colleagues as well. So I really want to echo that as well. 
So now, right now, we're just going to open this up to uh, discussion amongst all. But we're going to, uh, this is actually just for the BIPOC students and the students that have been primarily infected, but I mean, not infected, sorry, <laughs> primarily, <laughs> uh, not the COVID, primarily affected, right, by the prison industrial complex. So if anybody has any comments and wants to speak or has any questions, go ahead and do so. By our people. Come on now, don't all jump at once. Okay. So we could also start with the facilitate discussions that critical resistance had. Um, I think one of them was how does CCSF be supportive of abolition within our school? First of all, you're dealing with a structure that you did not create. You're dealing with a system that you did not create. And it's very difficult working within a system uh, that has uh, limitations that you had no implementation of. You got to free, that's why I talk about being woke and being free the mind. Because once you're in an establishment, whether it's the social services, or whether it's a jailhouse, you can't break free of their rules and regulations. And so in that, you got to, uh, you know, you got, you got to work outside. You got to work outside because they, the chancellor, they change them. They make so much money. And then uh, the other thing is uh, you have people who've been there a long time who, who nepotism, San Francisco is very good about nepotism. They get their friends and their family. They give who they want classes to, just like the sheriff department uh, gives jobs to their friends and family and nobody's holding them accountable afford, you know? So I'm saying we're dealing with a, 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 a caste system, not just class, but a caste system. So in that, you have to be very, very war because if they shut you door and say you can't come in there, you can't come in there. How many people are you going to have walking down the street? So you cannot give them the power to be uh, where you you, they're going to organ, you, you know, if, if you're dependent on them for your organization because it's not going to work. Uh, uh, thank you for that answer. And like everything you're saying is just nothing but wisdom, and I really appreciate it. I really, really do. Thank you. Uh, no, first of all, thank you for just gracing us with your wisdom. Like I always listen to my elders and my OGs, right? Because the OGs always have advice to give to the younger generation, right? And it's always like nuggets of wisdom, and like like a lot of people don't really like. When I say a lot of people, I mean myself. I was raised by my grandmother, right? And a lot of times she would always say things and it's just be like, okay, whatever, like, Brad, stop talking to me, you know? Like, oh my God, you know? But then like, as life goes on, you're like, oh my God, everything she said was a fact. So thank you. Um, I want to open it up to anybody uh, that wanted to respond to, to what was just said. I can't get out. Too close. Before, there's another question about the entrance, yeah. rates, right? So, someone has a question that um, they've been deeply affected by the Asian hate crimes as someone that's from the Philippine ex community. And they've also noticed posters in Asian focused socials that are very anti Black. How do we seek peace, justice, while also fighting back against the racism that is instilled within Asian culture? Okay, first of all, stop listening to the damn news. Just like I said, there was the Red Guard, there was the Black <laughs> Parade, and there was the Black Panther. They, in the same community, uh, these uh, um, ill-minded people uh, jump on old Black people in the Black neighborhood, but they don't put it on national news like that. All right, so what I'm saying is, is that, Yes, it's happened, and yes, it's uh, awful, but, ha but they're making an issue behind the defunded police thing in Oakland. So in that, uh, the mayor, Schaff, is on board with bringing more military because they, oh, it's a problem. And they did the same thing when they was talking about public class. Oh, three strikes and you're out. And then in that, you have to be aware of uh, propaganda. One, one of the things that made me very aware of propaganda is my years living in, in Cuba, socialist Cuba. 
propaganda, they would have to cut out them because they're telling you what to think and how to think and who's the enemy and who isn't. We are a similarly oppressed people, okay? And I'm so glad they finally changed the name to Frida Kahlo Way because that other uh, um, Asian races, they kept that name feeling, they kept that there for too long. And then when I tell the students about it, like, oh, they didn't know about it. You know why? Because we're not taught the truth of, of who, we, who we are, where we came from and how we got where we are. So I, I hear that. And I, just, and I just wanna say one little small thing really quick. I know you're gonna stop. It's that uh, when I was in Cuba, uh, there was a sister there, Edna Lee. She was Chinese. I grew up uh, in San Francisco. So that means I grew up all around uh, um, Chinese and then the Vietnamese didn't come until the 70s. So that was later. So um, I'm just saying there was, oh, it's been a solidarity. We sit in the same place uh, she was the one who really taught me how to clean up in Cuba. She said, well, stop putting things in two different places when you can put it in one. I'm like, okay, yeah, Nelly. She had, uh, her, her boyfriend had hijacked a plane to Cuba and he committed suicide. So she was out there by herself. So I'm saying, stop allowing propaganda to permeate who the enemy is. Thank you so much, Ida. I also want to respond to someone from the community side. Historically, there has been solidarity. As Ida mentioned, there's been the stereotype or this divisive tactic that people use to split our communities apart. That's bullshit. Um, CCSF collective members who actually participated with community to do AAPI and back solidarity zine. Like, mm -hmm. Sean was there. I'm so mm -hmm. happy. Um, mm -hmm. Marquise was a part of it. Solidarity is real. I also want to say Japantown is in film. You know, like Japantown is in Filma. At the end of the day, people that are from Filma, like they grew up around Asian folks as well, right? That, like, that's back to what Miss Eda just said. Like, like being from the city, you just have no choice. You know, like if you're a weirdo, you know, like you're going to be alone, you know? Like it's just not going to work for you. Like you go to school with people of all walks of life, you know? Like, and at the end of it all, like, like they just said, you just, you can't, you can't like listen to the propaganda because it does teach you who not to like and who to like. Um, Nick, did you have any comments on anything going, right, that was said right now? Yeah, um, no, everything like really resonates with me. I wouldn't say I have too much to add, but just thinking like in terms of like, you know, working in coalition spaces, you know, you're going to work with a lot of different folks and different orgs and you're not all always going to see eye to eye, but, you know, that's part of the struggle that we're trying to get through, you know. Um, society now just teaches us, you know, to be in conflict with one another, to like mm -hmm. not see eye to not be able to have conversations and talk and, you know, be able to work through things, but, you know, in doing that, we're building community and we're starting to see each other. We're starting to hear each other. We're starting to build those uh, lines of solidarity and understanding who really is our enemy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, what Ms. Ida was saying, like, is for real. Like, we gotta know who our enemy is and our enemy is the system. Our enemy is America. Like, you know, it's not each other. It's not our communities. You know, we're all scrambling for these resources, but who's making the resources scarce? It's America, it's capitalism, you know? So we're gonna be free once we, you know, listen to like the black rattle tradition, our native um, brothers and sisters, our indigenous folks that are fighting line three. Like once we kill this capitalist system, then we will be free and we're doing it in steps along the way. And I think that's important and why, what brought me to abolition is that it really points us in a direction of like making sure we're not creating something that we have to break down later. You know, like we want abolitionist reforms that are really gonna create uh, take the power away from the state and put it into our hands while also breaking down the power that they've built up over, you know, over decades and generations. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's just keeping your eye on the prize, you know, keeping your eye on the prize and just trying to wade through all this media bullshit that constantly is being shoved down our throats and acted like that's the only way we can get through, you know. Um, and then also as like a photographer and a media maker myself, it's my job to work and see my art as warfare, as media warfare against the state. You know, I want to put out images that are fighting every day to, you know, put power into our communities and to fight back against the narratives that allow the state to vilify us, to harm us, to, you know, give reason to why, you know, we don't deserve things because it's not true. It's not true at all. 
Uh, the other thing is I want to say when I was in Cuba, I've learned a lot uh, in my years in Cuba. And one of the things is that, you know, people say, oh, it was a demonstration here. No, the people that say they didn't, uh, they didn't want socialism um, is what happens. Um, you have to change the thought process. Otherwise, you have the same thing in a different system. And I want to tell you, too, as a counterintelligence move, beware of people always creating conflict in your groups. All right. So just be, uh, you know, be aware. Where is this going? Because once you're successful, uh, where are you going to spread your uh, your media? On Facebook, they'll knock you down in a heartbeat. On IG, they'll knock you down if they don't see what you're saying. So we have to develop our own systems of communication. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then Gloria, did you have any comments? or anything to say about this topic. So I wanna echo what everyone said and also bring in just the thoughts and words of Kat Brooks, who is very, very involved here in Oakland um, with city council and with the anti-police terror project, um, calling to defund and abolish the police here. Um, she has spoken about how, you know, the, the state, the police, they benefit from us being against each other. They benefit from us um, not seeing each other as a collective. Um, and so really taking that into account when we hear that news that's being fed to us, that, that those um, perspectives that are being thrown at us, like who's, who, whose um, agenda is that? And who does that benefit? Not us, not us, definitely not um, Black people, not Indigenous, not Asian, not people of color, not Native, right? It, it really doesn't. Um, and we see it play out day to day. Um, and yeah, I would say that's somebody else too that I, I admire, Kat Brooks. If you all haven't um, heard of her, look her up. Um, she's pretty badass. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then to Marquise, same question, any comments? Yes. Everybody, thank y'all for what y'all, yeah, it's propaganda. Um, there's been a similar spike in crime across the board. And there are people who aren't getting any of the publicity because the state and the media have an, a vested interest in, in pushing that narrative. I mean, the police and the state are just creating a fight so that they can come and break it up or whatever, right? But just echoing what everyone was saying, like y'all are on point. And, and this is the same thing I just want to add when they have the so-called protests, all of a sudden somebody comes up and start doing something weird. Those are infiltrators, all right? And we need to be aware of the whole infiltration. And we need to, one thing I was, um, uh, that we were very consistent about, you know, because you had the RNA, you had the Weather Underground, you had the Black Panthers, you, I mean, you had so many different organizations who were working in nucleuses. It's not to point to one person, but make sure that everybody knows as much as they can uh, on how to continue and, and you know, how, how to continue and, and be a, as aware. Because if you chop off the head, the body dies. And they're really good at chopping off the head, okay? They've chopped a whole bunch of heads. Okay, so I also want to open this up to BIPOC commentary and questions regarding like any, uh, regarding Free Mumia, um, regarding uh, kids in cages, um, or just, Anything that want, uh, or abolition at City College, just anything that was covered. Alex wants to ask a question. Alex? Yes, go ahead, Alex. Hi, um, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you to everybody for um, doing the work that you do and coming and sharing it. Uh, I'm a former organizer with All of Us or None, and so I'm very entrenched in the work as well. And Ida, me and you, Oh, sh oh, there you are. We go way back. Um, so I just want to say thank you for coming and sharing the game that you shared with me, <laughs> with everybody here. Um, I'm sure y'all saw all my comments, like listen to Ida and all these folks. Uh, they have so much wisdom to share with all of us. Um, and I also want to just mention to like everybody in all of the organizing that we do, it is so important that we uplift political prisoners and um, the all the campaigns towards freeing them. 
there are so many uh, people that we've lost this past year inside of prisons. Um, sorry, I'm tearing up. Uh, recently, we lost uh, Chip Fitzgerald. Anyway, I gotta say, uh, free Mumia, free Peltier. Peltier. <laughs> uh, free Matulu, free all of them. Uh, all of these folks are doing, have done all this work and sacrificed their whole life for us to keep doing this work. Um, so just, just uplift them. Thank you. Sorry, I'm crying. I love y'all. It's okay. It, All right, to the prisons. No, Alex. This is yeah. very, this, honestly, I share the same sentiment. This is a very triggering session, right? This is very hard for a lot of people to hear, and like from start to finish, honestly. It was really hard for me. I had to take a break myself. I had to take a snow break outside. It was just hella hard, like, you know, so it's okay like being like it's really really tough to like have these very deep conversations and all of these conversations like really really hit home you know like like when mandated reporting was mentioned that shit hit way home like that like you know like and then like to know a lot of people that that have been detained like or the fact that like i live off 24th street right i just moved there two years ago i like like I, like at the end of the day, I feel like a gentrifier, like, you know, because I can afford to live there, you know, and the people that like the people in that neighborhood, like, unfortunately, can't afford to live there. So by definition, that makes you a gentrifier, right? But at the end of the day, I still hang out on 24th Street, just where all the brown people congregate. So at the end of the day, we like we we all experience these things firsthand. We've all seen these things firsthand. So you're absolutely like cool to just like share your emotions it's very hard it's very hard um thank you for that comment alex thank you very much um, thank you i really well, appreciate y'all um and yeah thank you for allowing me to share my emotions and like my vulnerability in this space uh because like Sally said in the comments our pain does need to be visibilized um and uh, my former boss, or not boss, I, my former comrade, he's still a comrade of mine, Dorsey Nunn. Uh, he wrote a poem when I used to work at LSPC. And in that poem, he said uh, that, he, not, that he can no longer lie to people about where he's been because then no one will know that he was actually hurting, right? Um, and we have to be honest about our struggles and not allow the propaganda to shame who we are um, and uh, not allow the cops to scare us away from doing the work that we need to do. Um, yeah, there's just so much shit that we have to do to end this system. And, and this is why I cry because I've been waiting for so long. <laughs> for this to be brought to city college you know um we need this not just at ccsf but everywhere so if you're in the east bay um bring this into your spaces in the peralta school system everywhere um it doesn't it doesn't end here it just grows from from here to palestine we're gonna tear all these walls down yeah. Yes. And so Jazz also has a question. Um, so I wanted to pass it along to Jazz for your question. Oh, oh my God. Sorry, I'm emotional to right now. But um, I just want to say thank you, you know, to everyone that spoke, um, including you, Alex. You're all warriors. Um, and I really wanted to ask y'all, I know a few of you mentioned, but how because we're here, right? But like how, Ida, can we continue to support you and, you know, organize with you? Because it's like, I love this, but it's like, like you said, them white people ain't gonna come to the ground, right? So it's like, you know what I mean? This thing ain't gonna come, like we're out here on the ground. So it's like, how can we continue to 
organize to support each other and much love. Okay, y'all gonna think I'm crazy, but y'all got this recorded, but we got to build some underground railroads uh, for the undocumented. We got to build some underground railroads for people who have no place to stay, all right? We have to recreate the past to make it in the present. You, uh, you may live here on, on 24th, somebody lives somebody there, but you know, they got people living, you know, the, what the hell, it was the bottom of the laundry mat there on Mission in Persia. I mean, we got to build some underground units that people don't know about so we can hide them and we can protect them and we can get them the, what they need. Okay, I don't want to say too much on this recorded line, but the, you know, I was a fugitive for 16 years. Okay, none of the children that I have 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 um, except the first one have my name on their birth certificates. All right, we have to create something that helps nurture the people once we're able to free them from these systems. And, and in that, uh, we just need to start thinking about building an underground railroad. <laughs> First of all, yes. I also want to echo everything that I was just sat there and said. I believe that, like, like, we, in my opinion, right, this is just to add on to the question. In my own opinion, this is not in, 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 any like reference to anybody else. I believe white people need to do the work, right? I believe they need to sit there and put the money where and put their money where their mouth is. A lot of times they like to go out and, and come to these to these gatherings and to these these spaces that are POC, and it's almost as if it's a spectacle. And it's like you know, it's like Facebook warriors, you know. And it's like you like, and I I urge this to all of our allies. I put your money where your mouth is, right? This is not for this is not for clout on social media, right? These are people's lives, right? People are actively being imprisoned for being who they are, for being black identity extremists, you know, at the end, or for being or for being uh, outspoken against uh, uh, people being being put into uh, uh, cages, you know. So at the end of the day, like it just like. We need stronger allyship. Um, I will also, uh, Fabio also has a question and I will pass it to Fabio. Fabio, are you able to? Uh, I think they may want to read our comments maybe. Do you want us to read your question for you, Fabio? Mm -hmm. Most likely, yes, here's the question. Okay. How can we? Sorry, I'm going to do this. Oh. All right. So Fabio asked, "How can we help the families that are being separated? How to help the kids that cannot be reunited with their families?" And I suppose this question is specified towards Gloria. Yeah. Thank you, Fabio, for for that question. Um, there's definitely many ways that we can support children and youth that are coming into the country unaccompanied unaccompanied. Um, so th there's ways in terms of, you know, when there's city council meetings and there's a shift in housing, right? Like now San Francisco, the, the housing programs require some of them, most of them a social security and how that's a barrier for, for youth who are going into housing programs. Um, housing programs is the way that, that we advocate for children to be released when they don't have family. We set them up with community-based organizations like Huckleberry House, like Larkin, like Covenant House, right? But now that some of those places require social security through no fault of, or one of their own, but like it was like implemented by the city, that's already blocking um, children and youth from being able to facilitate those services or, or sorry, um, utilize those services. Um, so really showing up for very local, local meetings um, in terms of when decisions are being made that way and, and where funding is going, right? Um, also, when when new sites are trying to be constructed for, for RRR or used for RRR, like just um, earlier this year, um, there was a military base that was um, RRR was trying to contract with to house and, and jail children there. Um, and the community went out there and protested against that because they were like, why are you using money to to send children to this place when you can be expediting family reunification for children that are that have family in the US. Like you can be reunifying them quicker. Like, you know, instead of spending that money on, on these jails, spend it on the child and their family. 
Um, and also, let's see, there are programs that like Tangia and Centro Legal de la Raza that are um, in need of individuals who have any legal background or expertise in filling out applications for, for individuals who are entering the country and also in becoming sponsors. So if you have an spare room in your home or, or know of somebody, like you can house families or children, um, become uh, a sponsor. And yes, I can provide links. I can provide, um, I know that at the end of my presentation, I included, uh, included a lot of organizations that I recommend and um, believe that are in this fight with us. And that would be definitely individuals and organizations that I would recommend following in terms of keeping up with what you can do locally, statewide and nationally. Um, thank you for that answer and thank you for that question for you. So now I will pass the floor to Ray. Oh, I think, I think Miss Ida, did you have a, a comment? I'm Ida, like the hurricane. Oh, Ida, okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so I just have a question for Sister Gloria here. Um, one thing about San Francisco is 49, you know, seven by seven by seven. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of land that's very, not much, but also um, in the South, there's a lot of land that's cheap. And in that, you know, not many people have, you know, we already have a room enough for the people that we know. I mean, you know, I got so many people in my house, it's not even funny, but I'm just saying, uh, you spoke, Sean, about, you know, monies, all right? I think some monies could be well-funded if, uh, where there's, it's a lot of land in this country. I just drove across country twice. It's a lot of land. And if we could get some land somewhere, then what she's talking about, oh yeah, um, maybe they can be transported from uh, one place to the other. Because right now, as long as they're under the auspices of programs and social security numbers, which is nothing but a, a, a brand, you know, they, they give you a prison number, they give you social security. I mean, there are ways to identify you that we need to, we always just say this, free the land, free the land, free the land. All right, it's for a reason. It's because if we can help uh, build communities in other places where there is more room, that way there's that railroad that we were talking about. That's all I want to say. And that's spot on. Uh, and then I'm gonna pass this to Reed. Ryan. Oh, Ryan, sorry, I keep messing up names. <laughs> it's all good. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for all of your time today. And um, I was really sitting here trying to think, like, how do I ask this question? Um, but one thing I've been struggling with when uh, community organizing, and I just like jumped into the nonprofit realm, and I'm seeing like, oh, there's kind of an issue here, too. <laughs> Um, it, it's driving me nuts because, you know, I kind of joined the nonprofit to escape corporate stuff, but then I'm like, oh, you guys are the same thing. Um, so I wanted to know, like, if you have any um, ideas or advice about, like, how can we work together to, like, rebuild or create something that we can uh, still survive in this capitalist society while we're working on rebuild or rebuilding systems that work and benefit us. Um, and then I definitely wanted to know more about the uh, like housing ideas, because that's something I'm seeing a lot in Oakland too, um, touching back on what Gloria had said of trying to even uh, land some housing, the requirements that people have now, it kind of makes me laugh because <laughs> it's kind of like I'm applying for a job. There's just so much information, personal information they require from me and other folks um, in order to, for them to say like, yeah, I guess we can take you. Um, or the one where it's like the, that the requirement for income is like four to five times what the rent is. And it's like, if I was making that money, I would not be looking at this housing in the first place. No offense, you know, <laughs> but just stuff like that. Any ideas for how to navigate this capitalist space while we continue to rebuild so we can keep each other safe? Uh, 
I I uh, I would love to just a answer that a bit, like partially. Um, I just love your questions. Um, that is such an important question. Like, yeah, how do we, like, how do we build an alternative to like these supposed systems of help um, that don't help, right? That are just corporations. Um, just my advice um, is, yeah, just something that doesn't depend on like the state, doesn't depend on the state's money. Um, that's something that's not corrupt. Um, banding together to buy some land and then building that land together, um, you know, starting a co-op, you know, occupying a house together and then using the extra room to house people. Um, just some ideas that come to mind. I, I just went, I just came back from a trip um, to a farm. And yeah, that's, I, there's some people doing that and it was beautiful, but they have a completely self-sustaining farm, almost an endless supply of like pig meat. And um, just, they can trade, they can trade pig meat for other things. And it's, we can do that. We can, it's possible to not depend on, um, capitalism and, and, and then but also it's it's possible to, yeah so it's possible to, to divorce from capitalism and then also be able to bring other people with us so um, my advice is just yeah just a collective solution just fundraising you know just a wild idea that we all come together to, to like make happen yeah move did it and they got bombed but anyway uh they did it again. That too. That too. okay yeah. they did it right in the middle of a block in philadelphia you know fabio oh yeah hello um about the question of how can we create um like a web I think, or like a unity to live through capitalism as a conversation and like to, from there, um, start building a new tomorrow. Uh, I was just thinking about like sharing our spaces, like our apartments or houses or garage, maybe rent uh, locals or houses to help people that doesn't have like, we want to have to use money for that. So we'll have to use capitalism um, and ways, uh, but we can also occupy and, um, well, yeah. and, and I don't know, like we can get together in, in parks or like in more private places uh, and talk about this uh, and, because there's a lot of beautiful ideas floating here around and like, it's just about to put it into matter, right? Like in the material world. Uh, and just that, like sharing our spaces and getting together uh, to build, to start building like a, like a, I don't know how to say it, maybe like a coop or like a core where like, uh, like, from there it gets spread like from different places in the city or in the world or in the web right and like but, the but first like yeah the railroad yeah the underground <laughs> railroad that's yeah. that's the thing yeah. yeah and that's the underground railroad like it, all of i don't know like i, <laughs> I love you hey thanks for that and uh yeah it, yeah gracias yeah uh so every wagon like all of these ideas like uh community gardens to to grow like our food right um renting or like occupying spaces and then sharing like or like maybe like maybe i don't know like getting things from stores and distribute distribute them right in the best possible way uh and so just that and like thank you for this a lot and thank you for uh, being so open for everybody to be part of. Yeah, I just want to piggyback off of what the comrade just said. Like, I totally agree. It's so much more attainable than we think it is. Like, there is like 40 of us in this room right now. If we all just like within five years, like contribute a thousand bucks, we can occupy some land and we can like start this shit. Like, it's so much, you know, and so I really like what the comrade was saying. Like, um, yeah, it's just about starting that shit meet up at a park and let's let's get it going 
Oh, I was gonna say too, like occupying land, like like being like somebody, like I don't know, like I have a problem with like not living in the city of San Francisco. So if we're like buying land, it has to be a Victorian. You know what? I, <laughs> it has to be a whole row house. You know, I'm down to do that. I don't want to live in the middle of 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 bum fuck nowhere. You know, I'm not trying to do that. You know, period. That's not me. You know, like, that's just not me whatsoever. <laughs> also, though, um, I'm going to pass it to Erin. Thank you, Sean. Um, Fabio, that was such an inspiring thing to hear from you. It seems like everyone's just, like, coupling on it. I hear people saying, like, oh, should we co op should we go off our own land? Keeping in mind, matriation efforts, of obviously. And Tatiana, just hitting it on the head, total armed revolution, maybe. So I just wanted to end the session. Um, please keep it brief because I know we're over time with the question. In your world of streams, how do you all see us creating an abolitionist world together? And how might this vision overlap with CCSF? So I'll look for all the speakers to answer to that. Um, please let me know who wants to go first. If you're able to stay. Yeah, if you're able to stay. <laughs> and I'll add that. We have to organize, okay? Uh, it may not be the place for Sean, but it may be the place for Tatiana, or maybe a place for Fabio or someone else. Um, but we have to organize. You can't do anything unless you're uh, unless we're organized together. Uh, um, and I'm I'm gonna say you know the NFL is a nonprofit, so I hear the sister talking about nonprofits. But uh, within that organization, have a purpose, uh, okay? That place may not be for you, but it'll be for someone else or be for one of Gloria's children who ages out of the system. And in San Francisco, you're looking at a big more uh, uh, people finna get evicted from left and right. You're looking at the mon mon monopolization of single family houses from these hedge funds. So we have to live in bumfuck nowhere, all right? And, 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 and build that place up. <laughs> <laughs> that's true i get it i get it it's just not ideal <laughs> <at all>. like, <laughs> thank you so much ida for answering that um I ida have... ida ida like the ida. storm ida ida like ida b wells okay <laughs> i want to open up to either gloria marquise or nick to answer i'll go ahead and just piggyback off of um Ida, you just you're magical. Thank you again. Serious like thanks for being here and sharing your knowledge. Deep appreciation for you. Um, Thank you. And just to piggyback, so you said organize. I think imagine um, is the is the next um, word. Um, and Im imagining is so important. Like this whole state is separating us from who we are. Um, better ways of living that are more healthy, um, that are less hierarchical. Um, they're shoving this idea that we have to punish each other, we have to murder each other, disappear each other, um, and that we can't trust each other. Just, you know, they're, they're, they're also shoving this idea that there's limited resources um, and that, you know, like you have to fuck people over to survive. Um, and we just have to break out of that conditioning, that constant propaganda, um, and just imagine and or, or try to connect with different ways of being, but just imagination, um, just imagining a different system, right? Imagine everybody's well-fed. Imagine everyone has safety, shelter, food, just all their basic necessities met. Imagine what that would be like, right? Um, so um, just imagining, and I think a critical part of imagining and being and learning alternatives is 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 education and CCSF. Um, just just being here and talking about the alternatives together is like that's the first step. But just imagine. <laughs> it all starts with the conversation and the feedback and action. CCA. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Mark Hughes. So from organizing to imagination, I just also want to amplify what Tatiana mentioned, which is like also remember that a lot of us are settlers or displaced indigenous people. And where we do these things does matter. So thank you so much for emphasizing that, Tatiana. And I just want to open it again to either Nick or Gloria. Please feel free to answer the question. 
And again, it's in your wildest dreams. How do you see us creating an abolitionist world? And how may this vision overlap with CCSF? Education. I can go, I can go and just um to, sorry, I can't, I'm having a little bit of connection issues. So hopefully y'all can hear me. Um, thank you. Uh, so I wanna, you know, agree with what's been said and also the last part of how may this vision overlap with CCFS. It's like CCFS is the home of many individuals attempting to, to, you know, take on courses of every, every single subject possible. And it's like, how do we, how do we bring in individuals from all these different experiences and backgrounds and really put together like, all right, what are your skills? What are your strengths? What are your goals? And, and really build it into a collective, right? So I feel like in City College, there's already, there's so much knowledge there from different individuals that can really offer so much and are already offering that, but like, how do we connect with each other so that we can build together um, and not have it be so isolating? Because I, I do believe that, um, you know, I, I've been to City College before, not as a student, but I, I've been there and some of the youth that I work for have been and, and are students at City College. Um, and it's like for, for, for them being there, most of them have had amazing experiences, some of them not, but that, that talks about like, what else is needed? What else is needed um, from making school settings safer? And that is also abolishing these systems that, you know, where police officers can go into or like police officers are trained, et cetera, right? Um, so I think there is already a wealth of knowledge of in, in, in the individuals that are there and how do we um, come together like we did tonight, but continue, continue. But you have to remember one thing too. There are people in the city that hate CCSF and they have a lot of power. OK, and that's why I was yeah. saying creating an abolition movement within you got to uh, make it transcend the walls. And I'm talking about people with power, politics, mm -hmm. you know, as uh, my friend Tiny says all the time. <laughs> yeah, I can go. Can go, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Cool. I um, Gloria, and then what Gloria mentioned, it's cops off campus, get out the training for the police at the community colleges. Go ahead, Nick. And fuck pigs. Yes. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, um, man, so much shared already. That's so great. I'm like, damn, where do I get in? Um, organizing, for sure. Rigorous struggle and rigorous um, um, education, like learning about our, our, you know, our histories, our, our movement, listening from our movement elders, you know, building on that legacy, that strong, strong legacy that we are, you know, have, have a privilege of, building, of knowing and being able to know and, you know, connecting with the people. I think for me, it's, uh, you know, it's, it starts within, you know, it starts within, like we, 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 are born, we were born into America, into this, you know, capitalism into this racist society and like you know we're some of us are just getting to a point where we're thinking about abolition you know it's not gonna start by you just you know retweeting something or reading like one book and like going out and you know knowing the talking points it's like you got to feel that deep inside first before you can start to preach it outside or even get other folks to like know what you're you're where you're feeling because you know the, the classroom will help us get to where we go, but it isn't like the one place where we can get it all. Like we need to be talking to one another. We need to be hearing one another. And, you know, we need to feel for me, like abolition being with critical resistance is like, it let, like, like for critical resistance, it hold, holds my feet to the fire being like, you know, that we're going to read this stuff, but also you got to feel it deep in your heart. You got to live it every day. Like abolition isn't just like a theory. Like we got to put our theory into practice, but like, we also got to have that rigorous study behind our practice too, or else we can get thrown off guard or thrown into, you know, the cycles that liberalism put us into and thinking that just because we disagree, we're the enemies, but no, it's the state. The states are the enemy. You know, liberalism is going to make us, you know, fight and we got to get past that shit because, you know, once, once, uh, you know, th these next few years are going to get rough. You know, they, it's been like, what, 10 years since we we saw um, Occupy, what happened with Oscar Grant? Like this movement's been going in 10 years. And if we look back to civil rights, you know, they had that 10 years. And then we saw the FBI crack back, crack down, the state crack down. And this is happening now. And we got to be ready. And we, 
should know like from our from the past of what's 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 to come and you know the next uprising that comes we, we better hit hard and we better hit fast because they're going to do the exact same thing to us our enemies are together whether it's you know the police organizing here and here in uh here in the bay you know you could during last year was uprising you heard all different police departments trading officers and going all over the bay or over to minneapolis or to dc and then we've got you know the israeli police or the philippine police coming here to train with our officers like they're organized we got to organize we got to organize just as hard because we got to fight back just as hard as they do as us right on mm -hmm. right on i'll show you that uh, thank you so much, everyone, for just reaffirming this pathway of abolition. We know that it takes many, many experiments to see how we could achieve the end result of that horizon. And we, yeah, as I definitely hear you, like it's how are we organizing it within the space, but then also outside of the structure. Um, I just want to reaffirm that like this course is structured where the first half is political education, and then the latter half is how are we fully organizing all together too. So. I definitely think we'll see each other again. Um, I just want to leave the closing comments with Sean or Gracie, you all want to say anything too. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, thank you, like this was really rad, like this session or the sessions that we've been having, it's just like, it's, it's hella cool to sit there and have like, back to Alex for being emotional. It's cool to have the space where she, when they felt that it was okay to sit there and 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 share their emotions, like that's the goal of this because this whole session was very very triggering for everybody and for a lot of not for everybody. Let me take that back. But for a lot of people, it was very very triggering. And I I wanted to thank everybody here for presenting and sharing information. I wanted to thank Alex for being um, allowing yes, yourself to be vulnerable and like, and, and share your truth. Cause there was a lot of times that I, I was teary eyed myself. It's a very tough subject and we're all in this together. Like, like at the end of the day, my only like piece of advice Billy is to find your lane and stay in it, right? Stay in your lane, right? Some people have more work to do than others. Some people need to back up and then show up and show up, right? In other ways. Right, like I, I want to thank the folks that the non BIPOC folks that are here that are still here, and and understood where we were coming from as well. Right, because you guys are true allies for real, for real. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone. Thank you, Miss Ida, right, for your information. Thank you for thank like you, being here and being from the city and being a black person from the city, sharing our information because we don't, as you know, we don't have much of them here left. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marquise. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you, Marquise, for your information. I appreciate you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Gloria. You guys, I, I appreciate you all. All right. OK. On the we'll move. See, we'll see folks on Wednesday when we have our disability justice and medical industrial complex session. Um, Marquise, I see that you unmuted yourself. So if you have anything to say, please do. Whoops. Sorry about that. It's OK. <laughs> okay, have a good night, y'all. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the calls and everything. Okay, Gloria, sigue el trabajo que está haciendo porque es muy, muy importante. Gracias. Gracias. Uh -huh. De nada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, y'all. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao, baby. <laughs> well.